The year was 1990. Republican incumbent North Carolina Senator Jesse Helms was polling behind his black Democratic challenger, a man named Harvey Gantt. It was a surprisingly competitive election, so Helms called in the political consultants, who in turn helped the Helms campaign figure out a way to fight back. And this is what they came up with, this ad. You needed that job, and you were the best qualified but they had to give it to a minority because of a racial quota. Is that really fair? Harvey Gantt says it is. Gantt supports Ted Kennedy's racial quota law that makes the color of your skin more important than your qualifications. You'll vote on this issue next Tuesday. For racial quotas, Harvey Gantt. Against racial quotas, Jesse Helms. That ad with the white hands holding the rejection letter as the narrator intones, you were a better candidate than the minority guy that they went with. Can you feel the injustice of it all? That ad was exactly what Senator Jesse Helms needed. He won re-election to a fourth term in the Senate, 54 to 46 percent. That strategy worked. It worked well. Making Gantt the face of affirmative action, a racial quota system that kept whites at a disadvantage in favor of less qualified minorities, that was potent stuff, the race baiting and the zero-sum politics. It moved people because it angered them. It made them believe the system was rigged against them and in favor of someone else. It was politically explosive, and that was 33 years ago. But the strategy to undermine affirmative action, a program to combat discrimination and correct centuries of racial injustice, the war against all that, it, well, it started well before Jesse Helms. This is what was happening 14 years before that. Certainly no one of us would challenge government's right and its responsibility to eliminate discrimination in hiring or education. But in its zeal to accomplish this worthy purpose, Government orders what is in effect a quota system, both in hiring and in education. They don't call it a quota system. It's an affirmative action program. Now, if you happen to belong to an ethnic group not recognized by the federal government as entitled to special treatment, you are a victim of reverse discrimination. Now, I'd like to have the opportunity to put an end to this federal distortion of the principle of equal rights. <clears throat> that was presidential candidate Ronald Reagan using the issue of affirmative action to critique President Gerald Ford and his Democratic rival, Jimmy Carter. Now, Reagan didn't win the presidency. He didn't even make it past the primaries. But, oh, boy, did he get his chance to chip away at what he called the federal distortion of the principle of equal rights when he won the presidency in 1980. And when Reagan took office, he found the perfect person to chip away at affirmative action. He put that man, his perfect candidate, in charge of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC, the branch of the Justice Department that is supposed to bring cases about workplace discrimination and hiring and harassment. And the man's name was Clarence Thomas. He was a young black lawyer who had graduated from Yale Law School just eight years before Reagan nominated him. And this is how one of that man's classmates describes Clarence Thomas's feelings about affirmative action. Clarence Thomas, by the way, someone who had attended schools and universities that were specifically trying to increase the number of minority students in their student bodies. This is how Clarence Thomas felt about affirmative action. He believed that people assumed he was there as a, as a uh, beneficiary of affirmative action and it grated on him. He has this feeling of, oh, I'm around these white students who he senses question his presence at Yale. How is it that you, not just you, Clarence Thomas, but you, all you black students are here? Is it because of merit or is it because of affirmative action? He said he would keep stacks of rejection letters he had gotten from law firms. Even when he was like a Supreme Court justice, he had these letters just to sort of remind him of those, again, this feeling of rejection by kind of the elite law firms. Clarence Thomas blamed Yale's affirmative action policies in the 1970s for his own trouble finding a job after graduation. He even stuck a 15 cent sticker from a cigar package on the back of his Yale diploma because apparently that's how much he thought it was worth. And Clarence Thomas is the guy Reagan picked to head up the office that was in charge of taking on affirmative action-related cases. 
with Clarence Thomas as EEOC chair and William Bradford Reynolds as the head of the Justice Department's Civil Rights Division. The Reagan DOJ pursued cases that sought to ban affirmative action policies. And Thomas, for his part, stopped bringing class action lawsuits to enforce affirmative action hiring programs. That pattern earned Clarence Thomas a public admonishment from the NAACP. But in the Reagan Justice Department, it was a different story. It earned him praise. During a ceremony held in September of 1985 to reappoint Clarence Thomas as the head of the EEOC, Thomas was flanked by Attorney General Edward Neese and Senator Strom Thurmond, the South Carolina segregationist, as well as Bradford Reynolds, who lauded Thomas as the epitome of the right kind of affirmative action working the right way. Bradford Reynolds called Thomas's reappointment a proud moment. But Thomas wasn't alone in the fight against affirmative action. Also in Reagan's Justice Department at the same time was a young man named John Roberts. As a young White House lawyer, Roberts helped the Justice Department make arguments against any government use of race as a basis for hiring and diversifying institutions. And he carried those beliefs with him throughout his 30s when he became the Deputy Solicitor General in the George H.W. Bush administration. And those ideas about color blindness would become a key feature of John Roberts' legal career. And then in 1991, Clarence Thomas was sworn in as a Supreme Court justice. In 2005, it was John Roberts' turn. And together, these two men, these two justices, have made ending race consciousness in American law, whether in affirmative action or in voting rights, they have made that one of the central causes of the court. The U.S. Supreme Court today ended its 2007 term with a history-making ruling. The court made it much tougher for school districts to control the mix of children in American classrooms based on race. The court said deciding on a student body in that way is not allowed under the Constitution. So they tried in 2007 and they tried again in 2013 and then again in 2014. But today, today they succeeded. Roberts and Thomas, joined by the court's four other conservative justices, voted to effectively strike down race-conscious admissions. In a 6-3 ruling, the Supreme Court found race-conscious admissions programs at Harvard and the University of North Carolina, they found them unconstitutional, in violation of the Equal Protections Clause of the 14th Amendment. Delivering the majority opinion, Chief Justice Roberts wrote, the Harvard and UNC admissions programs cannot be reconciled with the guarantees of the Equal Protection Clause. Both programs lack sufficiently focused and measurable objectives warranting the use of race, unavoidably employ race in a negative manner, involve racial stereotyping, and lack meaningful endpoints. We have never permitted admissions programs to work in that way, and we will not do so today. In a fiery dissent, the court's newest justice, Katanji Brown Jackson, called today's ruling a tragedy for us all. With let them eat cake obliviousness, she wrote, today the majority pulls the ripcord and announces colorblindness for all by legal fiat. But deeming race irrelevant in law does not make it so in life. If the colleges of this country are required to ignore a thing that matters, it will not just go away. It will take longer for racism to leave us. And ultimately, ignoring race just makes it matter more.